Right. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, this webinar uh, that uh, we will be delivering on sludge treatment technology. Um, myself, Sean Ormanroyd, um, and James Ingram, uh, both working for Southern Water, um, delivering this, this webinar actually from our home office in Brighton. Um, uh, we're just going to run through uh, sludge treatment technology, try and give you a brief overview of what, what it's all about. Let's get going. So a quick agenda on, on what we're going to discuss today. Um, I'm going to give a quick introduction into what sludge is, uh, where it's found, uh, and what we end up doing with it. Um, I'll also give a brief um, uh, description of how we move sludge, a little bit about pumping hydraulics, pump types that we use, um, and sludge conveying. Uh, James will then give us uh, an overview on thickening and dewatering equipment uh, and the basis of operation for those bits of equipment. Uh, it will talk a little bit about sludge mixing, um, and then I'll come back and talk a little bit about heating sludge, why we do it, what CHP engines are, um, and what type of heat exchangers we use. Um, and from there, we'll close and take questions. Um, should mention, obviously, that, that we will take questions throughout the uh, the presentation. Um, should that be on your right-hand side, hopefully. Um, feel free to ask any questions, and we will field them at the end of the presentation. So, what is sludge? Um, give it a brief description. Essentially, um, as that top bullet point says there, it is basically a byproduct of the water treatment process um, for both when we're treating wastewater to uh, be able to put back into water courses and when we're treating clean water suitable for drinking. Um, historically, it's always been seen as a waste product for us to, to dispose of, uh, but generally that is, that is changing um, because it's now seen as a, as a commodity um, to be used um, to, to release energy and to be recycled to farmland. Um, obviously, a key key part also is that essentially it's mainly water. Um, we end up with the sludges we deal with um, in their raw form um, can be from 95 to 99 and a half percent moisture content. So 99, you know, percent of of the content of the sludge is water. So uh, that's a key thing to to focus on. Um, in, in this webinar, we will be focusing on wastewater, the wastewater treatment process. But essentially, the 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 principles are the same uh, for when we're dealing with wastewater or or clean water sludge in terms of uh, the equipment we use. Um, so to talk about wastewater sludge, obviously consists of lots of things, um, but lots of nasty stuff, um, but also lots of energies and nutrients uh, that we can harness. Um, so as you can see, um, so we'll go on to where we find sludge. Uh, so essentially, uh, part of the wastewater treatment process and the clean water treatment process, uh, we, we, we essentially use um, a sediment tank, gravitational sediment. Uh, normally a, a tank with a sort of conical base uh, that is allow allow sludge to settle to the bottom. Uh, we normally um, use chemicals to aid the sludge collection, so to allow sludge to flocculate uh, and uh, uh, get to the bottom bottom of the tank. And and from there we we decant sludge regularly. Um, as you can see in this slide here, that's sort of trying to talk about the so that's the uh, primary. Uh, tanks, uh, so when it first comes into the process, but we also have uh, final settlement tanks, uh, which is part of the activated sludge process. I won't go into that in too much detail, but basically activated sludge is where we add air um, as part of the biological process for, for, for sludge, basically, or the wastewater treatment process. Um, but it's key to note that um, sludge can have differing properties depending on where we do actually collect it on site. Uh, so that's a key thing to note. And then what do we do with sludge? Um, we uh, thicken. Uh, we we always thicken um, because it gives us less sludge to treat. So when we say thickening, we're basically reducing the, the, the water content of the sludge. Um, we treat it. Um, we make it suitable for agriculture. Um, that's often where, where our sludge from our wastewater treatment um, sites often ends up. Uh, we to, to treat it, we digest it. Like digesting, digestion is the is the most common form of of sludge treatment. 
um, and we use it to, to generate gas and break down solids. Uh, we can pasteurize sludge. Um, basically, again, it's sort of making it suitable for for, for agriculture. Uh, and we also use something called a thermal hydrolysis process, um, which again is 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 a more advanced sludge treatment technology. Um, we next we we often dewater. Again, uh, talking about the fact that it's mostly moisture, um, we do water so there's less to dispose of uh, and less to transport um, around out to our sites. Um, obviously, sludge compliance is the, is, the, is the key thing here. Um, we're trying to make sludge compliant to be able to put onto farmland, which makes it more of a commodity for water companies. Um, so yeah. Uh, this slide just just to give you an idea of the um, the why we thicken sludge. Um, so obviously, just thickening it from one percent to two percent dry solids content, um, we we end up almost halving the amount of water that's in that sludge, which gives us less to treat. Um, and obviously, this this gives you a good idea that 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 obviously in in the lower dry solids range, when we're thickening, obviously there's a there's a there's large gains to be made. Um, obviously, as you go up, from, you know, four, five, six, seven percent dry solids content. Um, there's obviously less gains to be made at that at that point, and it's more difficult to mechanically thicken. Uh, and here, this gives you an idea of the, of the sort of cost that we're looking at. Um, obviously, we transport sludge a lot. So if we think about southern water, for example, um, we have 365 sewage treatment works across our patch in Kent, Sussex, and Hampshire. Um, and we only have, I say only, we have 16 sludge treatment centres where, where the sludge is actually treated. So obviously all of these wastewater treatment works produce sludge and that has to be transported to sludge treatment centres. Uh, the less of it we have or the less water that is in it, um, the less we have to move around and obviously the cost benefits can be seen there. So. Uh, so let's start to talk about how we move sludge. Um, so this is a little introduction to, into pumping sludge uh, and what we do. Um, obviously sludge rheology, so essentially the mechanics and, and how fluids behave um, is, 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 is the key thing to note here. Um, so different sludge types can have different rheological properties, i.e. they flow differently. Um, and they can sometimes be non-Newtonian, so obviously Newtonian fluids, you know, like a water reacts how we expect it to. Non-Newtonian fluids don't. Um, think about ketchup, for example. When you shake ketchup, it flows easier. That sort of thing. That's a non-Newtonian non fluid, so um, it's a key thing to consider. Uh, obviously, different dry solids content um, have different properties, and different temperatures of sludges have different properties. Um, so obviously, all, all, whenever we are trying to, to pump any fluid really, we, we try and uh, estimate a, a system curve or calculate a system curve. Uh, and clearly, uh, as you can see from the above, different rheology, different types of sludge can have um, quite a varying effect on that, as you can see on this in that graph on the right hand side there. So clearly, if we don't get it quite right, um, trying to pick uh, or trying to find a pump suitable to meet the duty point that we want can be quite problematic. Um, what we use in the water industry mostly, uh, so TR185, uh, it's a technical report which was released by the Water Research Centre in 1981, uh, is used widely in the water industry. It's very basic sludge rheology classification, so uh, i.e. it has primary sludge, uh, final sludge, it's just got you know uh, maybe uh, just a few categories basically uh, and uses rheological properties that it, for those um, different types of sludges. Um, Obviously, the, the, the drawbacks with that is that it doesn't have sort of modern sludges. So as, as sludge treatment technologies move on, um, obviously that is a you know a report in time, and it hasn't you know got newer sludges, let's call them, um, that that are, are are being used, and we, we still have to deal with on site. So uh, that's a key thing to note there. Um, sludge rheology databases. Um, I know there's a particular company that has a sludge rheology database which they are adding to. So it has more sludge classification. So as, as sludge treatment processes move on, we end up with different sludges, uh, and, and all of these are classified, and, and then the rheological properties are, are, are kept in a, in a database to be used to, to generate system curves. Uh, and lastly, sludge rheology measurement. So there we can actually take the sludges that we are going to pump, um, test them in the lab, um, and end up with 
rheological properties for that specific sludge that we are going to pump. Um, but I think again, one of the key things to note is that n not always do sludges stay in their condition. Um, so we'll talk about a little bit about how we, when we digest sludge, when we do so, we break down solids and sludge can sort of change in properties um, while we do that. So it's key to note. Um, now talk a little bit about the sludge, the, the, the pump types that we use. Um, clearly centrifugal pumps, I think most people will be familiar with that, that type of pump. Obviously we use that to pump water everywhere. Um, but um, we also use positive displacement pumps. They're the two main classifications of pumps we would use generally anyway. Um, but um, as you can see on the graph below, they've both got very differing um, uh, performance curves. So how they actually operate is, is, is very much different. So with your positive displacement pump, if you think about it as essentially as a bike pump, it's moving a fixed volume. So every, each pump, each time, for, as you can see there, that is a progressing cavity pump. Um, so it has a stator and a rotor. Basically, that is basically moving a fixed volume. So every time that, that, that shaft there turns, uh, it moves a fixed volume forwards. Uh, and it will basically do that at whatever pressure it needs to. So it will move that fixed volume at whatever um, back pressure it has in the system. So um, essentially, as you can see in the graph, uh, positive displacement pump curve is essentially um, straight up, basically. Uh, whereas a centrifugal pump, obviously using a motor to, to drive an impeller, um, has a very differing um, uh, pump curve. Um, and as you can see, because it, it's, it's going from left to right, if we look at, at that graph, clearly um, if, it, if the system curve moves, um, then the, the, the centrifugal pump is going to move in terms of its the, the duty point it operates at. So you're going to get a very varying flow for differing system pressures. So that's a key to, to consider. So just to, to, to wrap up on that, um, essentially pumping sludge are the basics. Like, is a fixed flow required? So that's a key question. Um, often it is in sludge pumping. So, so when we're trying to feed a dewatering or thickening equipment, obviously it's quite key that we are feeding that at a fixed flow. So um, clearly um, positive displacement or progressing cavity pumps will, will achieve that. That's quite a key thing to consider. Um, Another thing, are sludge properties likely to change? As I mentioned earlier, when we digest sludge, obviously the sludge properties do tend to change over time while they're being digested. Um, materials, so how aggressive is the sludge? Obviously, uh, the, the, the pump uh, you know, materials are, are, are certainly going to have to be um, uh, considered when we're looking at that. So, um, the obviously, centrifugal pumps typically are more efficient than progressive cavity pumps but only at the duty point at which that you are trying to uh, achieve. Um, so if the system does move away from that, then, then clearly they will be less efficient. Whereas progressing cavity pumps, positive pumps, uh, have a similar efficiency for different system pressures. Um, so they'll deliver the same flow at a similar um, efficiency, um, depending on where they are on the curve. So um, hence we, we, we do often use uh, progressive cavity pumps for pumping sludge. Um, but um, we also pump sludge in its cake form, so cake is literally as it, when, it's, when it is a, in its solid form uh, and we can use uh, boundary layer systems to do so that basically coat the, the outside of the pipe uh, to make it easier to pump. Um, and uh, last, last note to, thing to note there is uh, viscosity, obviously that is, that is key to sludge pumping. Um, obviously the more viscous, the, the harder it is to pump, it's as simple as that. So. Um, yeah, so I'll pass now over to James to talk a little bit. Uh, oh, sorry, I've got a li little bit more to discuss. Sorry. So w when we're, s we're still talking about moving sludge, uh, we're talking about sludge conveyors. Um, obviously, th these are used um, essentially to move a sludge in its cake form, as I mentioned there, um, when we're talking about solids. Um, screw belt driven is what we often use. So uh, screws we use, we tend to use now uh, shaftless screws. Uh, which saves more space. They basically they they end up in a um, in a um, in a hopper essentially. Let's call it that, sorry a trough, uh, and and we move cake with a with a motor attached to a screw. Simple as that. So um, we often use them to transfer dewatering equipment 
to to a storage area. So we end up with a storage area on site where we we end up with sludge cake, which is then moved further from there, um, either to farmland or where, wherever it may be, um, and also used to transfer cake from from a pump hopper um, to or to a pump hopper to dilute. Um, so obviously, as I talk, talked about earlier, we do, we dewater sludge at our satellite sites and then we move that to our sludge treatment centres. Uh, so obviously, we need to dewater it, or sorry, we need to dilute it to get it back down for the the sludge dry solids content that we need to treat it um, or to digest it. So yes, um, here we've got a little bit about sludge conveyors. So I've got a few photos here to give you an idea what we do. Um, so on the top right there, you've got a, a sort of belt-driven conveyor, um, literally just a belt on a on a series of rollers um, with a with a drive. We'll have a drive end, um, very simple technology. Uh, and in the middle there, you can see um, a screwless, com screwless, uh, sorry, shaftless screw conveyor um, in a trough there that um, obviously, again, just has a motor at one end that, that drives the screw. And uh, that moves sludge from one place to another. So you see in the bottom right there, we've got two skips um, in uh, below where, where conveyors are, are moving sludge to. Uh, and in the top left there, you can see that we um, move uh, moving sludge in via a conveyor into a big silo uh, for um, trucks basically to come on underneath, uh, collect sludge and move it to wherever it may need to be. Uh, so yeah, that is essentially moving sludge. Um, right now I'd like to pass over to James to talk a little bit more about uh, dewatering and thickening. Right, so I'm just going to uh, run through a typical sludge book diagram that you'd expect to see on a treatment works. Um, and tell you where the sludge storage, thickening, and dewatering equipment is likely to be located. Um, so sludges, as Sean has described, are collected and generated at various points on the treatment works, um, and they tend to be collected intermittently, such as a PST would be on a, a timed desludging basis. However, thickening equipment and dewatering requires a constant homogeneous feed, so sludge tanks effectively act as buffers in the system. So to run through the block diagram, you tend to have a, a, a sludge storage tank with your, your raw sludge in, and this would then be pumped at a controlled rate to the thickener before being pumped again um, to a thickened storage tank. Then it's, from there it's pumped to the digesters at a controlled rate uh, before being pumped to storage and then onto the dewatering equipment. <clears throat> so it's important to note that sludge tanks are, are used in each transition between thickening, digestion, de and dewatering equipment. And as I've said, this is important to maintain a constant, a consistent rate for processing, and also so that sludge tanks can act as a buffer in each process. So, just moving on to sludge tanks uh, and their mixers, if, if sludge that's kept in a tank will tend to stratif stratify and separate out between um, the dense and, and the less dense particles forming layers. So you need a, a sludge tank mixer in order to get that homogeneous um, liquid. So sludge tank mixers, um, they're required to not only mix the contents of the tank, but mix in the, the, uh, the incoming sludge that comes into the tank. Um, they're sized for the size of the tank. So um, if you've got a large tank, you tend to need a, lar a larger uh, mixer, but also you have to consider the viscosity or thickness of the sludge as well uh, in your selection. Um, they tend to need to mix the entire contents of the tank within a certain time. Um, and the mixer intake and the outlet position are critical because if the intake and the outlet are too close together, you'll get short circuiting and you won't achieve that full mixing of the tank. And I find that the best, the best performing tanks tend to have a, an inverted conical base um, with, with the suction taken out from the center at low level and then di discharges radially around the outside of the tank and this, this uh, encourages a circulation of the whole tank. It's also important to consider the suction side in the design because sludge being quite, can be quite thick um, and so the net positive suction head available um, can be reduced especially with a long suction pipeline. So you tend to use CFD to make sure that the, the MPSH available is appropriate. Um, Mixer pumps, they tend to have a macerating feature because it doesn't matter how many times you screen sludge, the rag always finds its way through. So 
the macerator will ma macerate any any rag that's in the sludge, and that protects both the pump but also the downstream processes that we'll run into. Next. Okay, moving on to thickening processes. You'll see on the screen there we've got a, um, a schematic of a, a gravity belt thickener. Um, these are quite commonly used in the water industry, and I quite like them because you can actually see what's going on. If you lift, an, lift up one of the access hatches, you can see the belt moving, you can see the sludge laying on the belt and the water draining away, um, and it's, it's, quite, it's quite good to see that. You can also see if there's anything not quite right, so if you haven't got the right polymer um, and you you're not forming flocks, you can see that quite easily. Um, again, you need a constant supply of sludge. Um, fed to the gravity belt thickener, and this is fed from the sludge storage tank. Um, en route, it's dosed with polymer, as I've discussed, and that goes through a, a static mixer. Um, and then on to the gravity thickener itself, um, you have a flocculation chamber, which is integral, um, and that allows the sludge to react with the polymer um, and, and form the flocks. Sludge then wears over onto the belt, um, it's spread out evenly over the width of the belt um, and, and as the sludge moves along the belt uh, liquid drains away through the porous the porous uh, belt and sludge passes forward getting thicker as it does so. There's, al there's also a series of ploughs on the belt and what they do is they redistribute the sludge um, and also turn the sludge over and that helps um, the process of drainage. At the far end there's an adjustable ramp um, and this make sure that any free liquid doesn't pass forward um, and the sludge backs up at, at this ramp before falling, in, before falling into a, uh, a dedicated um, pump hopper. It's best to use a VSD pump here, or variable speed driven pump, um, in order to maintain a level in the tank, in the, in the hopper, um, so that you, you're not starting and stopping your pump up the whole time, which can increase the wear. As the belt continues after the sludge has been um, dropped into the hopper, um, there's a cleaning process and there's spray bars in the lower section which operate continuously uh, because it's important to maintain a clean, a clean belt, otherwise it will underperform. You can adjust the speed of the belt. The um, faster the, the belt goes, the, the less the um, thickening will occur. So if you want to increase the thickness of your sludge, all you do is reduce the speed. Um, here's a few photos on the next slide. We've got um, top left, you've got the uh, flocculation chamber, and you can see where the sludge will wear over, slightly to the right there. And then on the top right, you've got the start of the belt where you've got the flock suspended in the water. Um, bottom left, just an overview of the gravity belt thickener. And then bottom right shows you the, uh, the plows arranged, which help to distribute the sludge. And then onto the Next slide, we've got just some, some more photos to show you the internals, really. But one to note is the, the photo on the top right, which shows you the ramp and the sludge backing up before it drops down into the uh, <coughs> the, uh, the hopper there. So moving on to alternative thickening processes. Drum thickeners, these are very, very common in water industry. Um, similar to the gravity belt thickener, drum thickeners also use a, a mesh membrane. It's a filtration process. Um, but the mesh is formed around a drum where the solids are retained within the drum and the liquid is drained away. Um, so flow is pumped to the thickener um, and poly is injected en route, same as the gravity belt thickener. Um, and in the image shown here, there's a flocculation tank on the right-hand side, and that's got a motorised mixer. You don't always have to have a flocculation tank, but it's best to have one. Um, if you've got enough upstream um, diameters between the uh, poly injection, the thickener. Sometimes you can get enough retention time there for the poly to do its thing before the thickener. On to the next slide, we've got some photos here, um, and I'll just talk a bit more about the process. Um, the sludge and poly mix is pumped into the drum, um, and on the inside surface of the drum, you've got a shallow auger, and what that does is it transfers the solids along the length of the of the drum. As it rotates, um, there's a slight inclination which encour encourages the gravity to take more of an effect here. Um, so on the on the upstream end of the drum, the liquid level tends to be a bit higher, and that liquid level has more pressure to the uh, sludge against the membrane. 
and that increases the efficiency of the thickening process. Some drum thickeners have an adjustable inclination, so you, you can you can uh, adjust the amount of thickness that, uh, that, that you're, you're getting out of the unit. As the uh, sludge continues, it exits into a hopper, similar to a gravity belt thickener, and uh, it's pumped away. Um, there's various ways to adjust the drum thickener in order to get the desired thickness on at the outlet, um, such as changing the feed rate, the drum speed, or the cleaning in interval can be adjusted, uh, and the polymer type and dose. Um, <clears throat> unlike gravity belt thickeners, um, drum thickeners need a uh, are cleaned intermittently. So if you need to clean the membrane, then you need to um, stop producing sludge um, and uh, operate the sp spray bars, which are located on the outside of the drum, um, cleaning inwards. So if you, if you see on the, on the picture on the top right, you can just about make out the, the spray bar there cleaning the drum. And then the bottom left shows you the internal view of the cleaning process. Um, the photo on the bottom right just shows you the, uh, the structure of the drum that holds it in position. Um, okay, moving on to picket fence thickeners. These are a very old technology, um, and they have a large footprint and high cost. Um, they consist of a tank which, with a motorised paddle in the centre, and the paddle slowly rotates during the settlement process. As wastewater enters at high level, at the centre of the tank, the paddle rotates, and this promotes separation of lower density and high density um, sludge and water. So, so that the, the lower density, more liquid um, sludge is wears over at high level and the sludge sinks down to the bottom of the tank where it's uh, drawn off. There's also a scum mat attached to the bottom of the paddle uh, and this sweeps the bottom of the tank um, and this stops the buildup of sludge on the base but also it um, sweeps it into the central cone where the sludge is drawn off. Typically, you can get about 1.5 to 3% dry solids from a picket fence thickener, so not extremely effective, but they are very robust and resilient with a very long asset life, but they are expensive to build, so they're not often built these days. So now I'm going to move on to dewatering processes. Um, the, by far the most commonly used dewatering equipment on wastewater is a centrifuge. And a centrifuge is a high speed rotating piece of machinery, typically rotating at speeds of more than three and a half thousand breaths per minute. Um, it's used to dewater sludge to reduce the volume as Sean talked about earlier. And this reduced volume means you've got reduced storage requirement, reduced transport costs and disposal costs. You can typically get between 22 and 30 percent dry solids cake, but we call it cake from the uh, centrifuge, uh, sometimes more. Sometimes you can get 35% um, dry solids here. As with um, thickening processes, you also need to condition the sludge with polymer, and you, t you need uh, 3 to 12 kilograms per tonne of dry solids, depending on the type of sludge you're processing. So to talk through the process, um, sludge enters the cent centrifuge in the centre, um, and you'll see the, the yellow section there which is a feed tube and this this feeds the sludge into the separation zone. Um, at this point the sludge is accelerated rapidly because you've got a fixed feed tube and then a high speed rotating um, the, uh, the bowl and it, so the poly reacts with the sludge almost in instantaneously and uh, it allows the water to separate from the sludge. It's not a filtration process but the the dense solid particles um, tend to press against the outside of the bowl due to the high gravitational forces. And liquid forms on, on the top of the sludge. Um, water traverses the centrifuge bowl, and this, this is shown in blue on the diagram, and that exits um, at the upstream end of the centrifuge. Um, but this is in the opposite direction as the scroll, which is the purple item in the centre. This is a, a scroll or a, an auger which transfers the, the sludge to the, to the right hand side where it's discharged. Towards the outlet you'll see the green outline of the centrifuge. It, tends, it tapers towards the end and this is the drying zone. 
And at this point, the solids are pushed up the taper. They, they naturally want to go back to the parallel section, but they're being pushed up by the by the auger, and this provides a, a, even more squeezing on the sludge um, to get a more dry product. Water level or pond depth, as we call it, um, is set by weirs at the uh, the outlet. So that's the uh, to the left hand side where the water exits or the the uh, centrate exits the, the unit. Um, you, you've got a series of weirs there, and you, you can adjust them. Some units have automatically adjusting weirs, but you can manually manually adjust most most of them. And the, the, the deeper the pond depth, the the cleaner your your wastewater or centrate is going to be. But it also means that um, the drying zone is reduced. So it's a bit of uh, swings and roundabouts there. Centrifuges operate automatically to set points of torque, and torque is equivalent to dry solids. So the, uh, the centrifuge controller carefully looks at the, the torque on the motor and adjusts the differential speed between the bowl and the scroll to achieve the torque required and therefore the dry solids of the cake. Uh, when you start up a centrifuge or during periods where you've got um, an inconsistent sludge coming into the centrifuge, the torque might be outside of the acceptable range um, or out of the, the cake might be out of spec or too wet. So an automatic system is usually used to divert this out-of-spec cake until the, the torque range is back within the acceptable range. Um, from experience, it's, it's best to get rid of this um, out-of-spec cake as soon as possible after it leaves the centrifuge. Um, otherwise, if it gets into, say, the sump, um, it, it, into the pump hopper or the, or the conveyor, it can cause much more problems. Um, on, on the next slide, got a few photos of um, centrifuges that I've, I've, I've seen. Um, some, some of these images are from Germany, some are in uh, southern water sites. Um, the bottom left picture shows a, a centrifuge on a thickening duty, um, and the same on the bottom right. Uh, I've drawn a circle around where the poly is injected, so it doesn't need a, a long uh, transit time. It can, it can be injected right before the, it goes into the centrifuge. Um, top right, we've got a uh, wastewater centrifuge installed on a dewatering um, duty up there. So, moving on to alternative dewatering methods, we've got the belt press. Um, these are less commonly used in water industry, but they have been used extensively in the past, um, and some water companies choose these to use them today. They, they thicken and dewater the sludge, and it's a continuous belt process. Um, and which is similar to a gravity belt thickener, but the belt press also has a compression zone, which I'll talk about a bit later. So again, sludge is preconditioned with a polymer um, before being uh, placed onto the the top surface of the the press, where the grab on the gravity zone, where any free liquid is drained away. Um, this thickened sludge then drops into the, uh, the compression zone. There's a there's a wedge which actually spreads out the sludge that's, uh, across the belt, so it's evenly distributed, and then it's sandwiched between two, two belts, which are both porous. It then passes into the compression zone, which is a series of, of rollers, which put the belts under high, high tension, and this squeezes out the, any, any remaining, well, a lot of the remaining water in the sludge. And then it, at the far side, on the right-hand side, you've got the, the cake discharged into a, a hopper. Depends on if you want to use a, a, a conveyor or, or a pump in a set application. The belt then continues to the underside of the unit where, where it's cleaned with a continuous spray bar similar to the gravity belt thickener. Um, if you need a drier cake, you can add more rollers to the compression zone, but there is a limitation here. You can't just keep adding rollers because eventually you, you won't be able to get a, a dry product. But if you want to, if you want to increase the dryness slightly, you can reduce the speed of the uh, the, the, the belt press. Um, however, if you, if you do have a dry product, you can, you're going to get more solids in your in your, in your filtrate, and this this may put a burden on the uh, the treatment works. Um, belt presses they've they've got a solids capacity, and if you increase the solids capacity, um, there is a higher risk of sludge escaping off the edge of the belt and into the filtrate uh, with the associated problems there. So just moving on to 
the final dewatering process, which is the booker press. Um, this is also a dewatering piece of equipment used on wastewater sludge, amongst other things. And it's possible to achieve up to 50% dry solids, uh, which has significant operational savings. Um, it consists of a, a piston inside a cylinder with an array of permeable fabric hoses, or socks as they're called, uh, are connected at, at one end to the piston and then the opposite end inside the cylinder. Within the hoses there's a grooved polymer insert and this is designed to prevent the hoses from collapsing under compression. Media or sludge is pumped into the piston chamber whilst both the piston and the cylinder are rotating and this allows the sludge to be spread evenly around the cylinder. The piston then begins to move under hydraulic pressure, reducing the cylinder volume and compressing the sludge contained within it. The press then opens several times to allow more sludge, more wet sludge, into the cylinder um, before a final pressing cycle is completed. And this compression forces water contained within the sludge to pass through the hose membrane, leaving now the, the now drier solids outside of the hoses. The filtrate is removed and able to pass along the inside of the hoses due to the internal structure. And once the compression phase is complete, the piston then pushes the cake through the lower opening in the cylinder, allowing the cake to drop either to a cake pad or into a conveyor hopper below. So I'm now going to pass you back over to Sean, who's going to discuss heating sludge. Yep, uh, so as we were talking about earlier, we heat sludge uh, as part of the treatment process. So we often heat sludge uh, as part of the anaerobic digestion process. Um, uh, with that, we, we are trying to basically maintain uh, sludge temperature up to 37 degrees. It's about the, the optimum temperature uh, that we try and keep sludge at uh, within a tank to, to digest it. Um, to, and that aids the, the sort of solids breakdown in the process. Uh, sludge pasteurization, as I mentioned earlier, again needs sludge temperature to be around 70 degrees centigrade, sometimes higher, um, and it gets essentially there again, it's just trying to keep sludge at a certain temperature, and that, that is basically to aid pathogen kill. Um, so the longer you keep it at a higher temperature, the more pathogen kill, kill you get, that sort of thing. So uh, again, it's about making it, um, making sludge compliant for um, use on farmland. Uh, THP, thermal hydrolysis process, obviously that actually uses steam uh, to the treatment process, which obviously means we need a water temperature above 100 degrees centigrade. Um, that's obviously also a key, key thing to note. Um, and then uh, now discuss um, how we get that heat. Um, obviously boilers are used. Um, so boilers, you know, running on natural gas, diesel or biogas. So biogas is the gas that we liberate from the sludge, basically, as part of the digestion process. Um, so we, as part of the solids breakdown in the digestion process, it produces a gas which is um, mainly methane, um, normally around 60 to 70 percent methane content. Um, but basically, this is obviously a combustible gas that we can use, um, and we can use it in boilers. But we also use it in our CHP engines. So we always have the CHP engines at sludge treatment centres, combined heat and power engines. Um, basically, we're using biogas to run through through an engine, generate generate electricity uh, that we can use for, to to power the site, uh, and also recover the heat for the process. So sludge to energy. Um, obviously, there um, we also get um, lots of water companies are uh, remunerated for using um, this renewable source of energy, um, but. Obviously, heat is basically recovered from the from the engine jacket, oil, and exhaust, and, and normally combined to give like a medium temperature hot water. Um, but they can also be segregated, so um, because they, obviously the heat that we get from the um, exhaust can be um, is, is of a higher temperature, and we end up segregating that certainly in the the thermal hydrolysis process. Uh, because we want to get uh, water up to a temperature of 100 degrees centigrade, so in, into steam form. Um, so we do that by segregating the, 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 the heat recovery systems. Um, obviously, boilers normally are used as a backup to CHP engines because obviously we, we like to run biogas. The biogas we have available, we like to run for our, for our CHP engines because we get electricity and heat. Obviously, boilers are more thermally efficient, but um, normally the, the, the go-to is, is use CHP engines and then go to boilers. Yeah. 
Uh, trying to give you a little idea of the process and how it works here. So uh, if you have a look at this this um, graphic here, um, we've also got a digester front and center. Uh, that digester from there, basically sludge is, is, is introduced into there. Um, we use a heat exchanger to heat sludge. Um, from there, we obviously liberate the gas. From the gas, we send that to, a, to our combined heat and power engine. That thermal energy is then used in the heat exchanger. So it's a cyclical process, let's call it. Um, so we use we, we digest sludge to get gas to run for a CHP engine. We use the heat from the CHP engine to to heat the the sludge that comes in to, to get that gas. That makes sense. Um, what we have done uh, historically is we we used to use dual fuel type engines. So uh, they used to be running basically with diesel. So they were compression ignition. Um, so they were using. Um, basically a, a, a small part of like pilot diesel so that diesel is, is what's used to compress is compressed ignited and that ignite ignited the, the biogas these are typically less efficient than the newer technology which now uses spark ignition engines uh, which is more common now in the water industry um, and as you'll see in that picture hopefully you can see in that in that picture that was chp engine uh, we end up with a chp engine nowadays that tends to come in like uh, shipping containers essentially and they're manufactured at a factory uh, by a supplier and then shipped to site in their entirety. So um, with all the heat recovery equipment within um, and what have you. So it tends to work quite well. But, but, the, but the, the spark ignition engines are, are generally more efficient than the older technology, the dual fuel. Um, but they also, one of the um, important things to note is 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 when, they, when we're looking to run them against site load, um, spark ignition engines don't generate as much torque, so they're not they don't particularly like uh, low rejection. So when we're turning, um, as we would on a site, um, turning th pumps on and off uh, and other equipment, um, spark ignition engines don't particularly like um, that low rejection. So uh, whereas generators and dual fuel engines running on diesel are, are quite happy to accept that. Um, so we often use um, sort of complex power management systems that, that manage the, 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 the sort of power load on site and bring CHP engines on and off um, in parallel with, with generators if, if as, as required. So gives you an idea. Um, to also talk about a little bit here about heat exchangers. Uh, so the type of heat exchangers we use to heat sludge um, and to get you know the heat from, from um, CHP engines to, to our sludge. Um, We've got sort of three types that I've sort of shown here. So in the top right is a tube in tube type heat exchanger. Uh, very simple technology, literally, as it says, a tube inside a tube. One, one of those tubes contains sludge, one contains water. So we t tend to use that for, for sludge to water heat exchanging. Um, but, uh, one down there is a spiral type heat exchanger. Again, this is also used for, for normally for water to sludge, um, literally just a spiral um, with uh, sludge through one spiral and then and water in the other. Uh, as you can see, quite simple. Um, obviously, the benefits of that is that it's got a smaller footprint, um, but they tend to be less efficient at uh, transferring heat um, compared to a tube and tube. And, and also, they have issues surrounding control because um, obviously control is quite important. So sludge baking uh, is something we should always consider. Basically, if we try and heat the sludge too much, if it comes into contact with water temperature of, um, that is too high, we can bake the sludge onto the um, surface of the um, heat exchanger, which is obviously undesirable because that ends up, uh, you know, ruining your process. Fouls it up means we, yeah, we have all sorts of issues. Um, so obviously, it's very important to control the water temperature that's coming to that sludge to water heat exchanger. Um, and the bottom right there, you can see we've got plate, just your normal plate of heat exchangers, which are used in many industries. Um, and obviously, that's really used for water to water. So the water um, heat that we recover from the CHP engine comes off in, into one of these type of heat exchangers into our, our own heating circuit, uh, which also contains water. Um, Digester mixing, as James was mentioned earlier, that, that's very important, obviously, to keep a homogeneous uh, content inside the digester so that we're not heating smoke, you know, cold, colder and hotter pockets, um, because obviously the, the the key is to keep that digester in its entirety uh, at a certain temperature, uh, not just little pockets. So it's quite um, key. Um, so sludge contact materials, we we tend to use a lot of stainless steel. Um, so grade three one six is is quite common because uh, some of the sludge can be quite aggressive. Um, so that's all 
key you can see in the top right actually in that tube and tube heat exchanger quite a lot of stainless steel is used in construction there so gives you an idea so yeah that's um, me talking a little bit about uh, heating sludge um, we're now going to come to a close I'll pass over to James to yeah so. yeah so that brings our webinar to a close um, just an overview we've just run through a range of the most commonly used equipment types to treat wastewater sludge and we've provided some guidance on the operation and a few considerations that are needed when selecting and operating these equipment types. Um, we could have gone into a lot more detail, but due to the time limitations, um, we've, we can only really brush over some of the topics here. Uh, but we do have plans to do a series of further sludge um, webinars so we can um, go into more detail in specific areas in the future. If you'd like to view the previous webinars produced by the IMACI, these can be found on the IMACI website. Um, and for those that are interested in the water industry, um, the Water and Energy A Marriage of Convenience Seminar is taking place on the 18th of June. So head over to the website and book a place on that. I highly recommend it. And we'd also like to thank you all for listening and welcome any questions you may have regarding sludge treatment technologies. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, we've got a few questions come through, which is great. Um, I don't know whether you want to start us off? Or? Um, yeah, I can kick off. Um, there's a question um, about the book of press here. With the uh, sludge book of press for dewatering, how is poly dosed into this system and what method is used to ensure the poly is dosed at the correct rate? So typically you'd use a, a flow meter on the feed sludge. So sludge is pumped um, via a flow meter so you, you know how much sludge is going into the, into the press or any dewatering equipment for that matter. Um, Ideally, you'd know the, the solids content because you, you want to dose your poly um, according to how much solids are going into the equipment. Um, so, I, first of all, it's, it's, it's easy to install a flow meter, but if you can, then install a, um, a solids meter. Then you have a, a poly dosing um, system, and which which looks at the flow rate. It takes the the, uh, the reading from the flow meter, and it it does uh, flow flow pacing. So it will pump the required um, polymer into the sludge, um, and that's a that's a set point that's put in by the operator or whoever commissioned the plant to achieve the, the desired output. Um, to, and to make sure it's um, mixed in uh, properly with the sludge, you have um, a, like a radial injection point, and you can have a series of injection locations. But typically, you'd have three at different points along the pipeline between the the pumps and the um, the press, um, and and you can choose uh, which one, which, whichever one works best basically. Um, and uh, after the injection point you have a, a static mixer which uh, obviously aids the mixing um, of the poly and the sludge. So hopefully that um, answers that question. Yeah, so I'll have a look at another question. Uh, Someone mentions here, uh, are there, are, am I aware of any digital tools these days that, that use TR185 as a base to calculate head? It's a good question. Um, no. The short answer is no. Um, obviously, with the um, sludge rheology database, I know that there is a company that that tend to use uh, to tend to sell their their, their 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 digital tool for calculating system head and calculating system curves. So they not only are they selling, you know, get, giving you their their database and, and the access to the to the rheology sludge different sludge rheologies, they also give you them um, a um, yeah, a, t a tool to actually generate a system curve. So um, what we end up doing in the water industry quite often, I mean, certainly we do it here at Southern Water and uh, have done in my previous jobs, is we end up ge generating our own tool, uh, which basically, you know, just an Excel-based tool uh, that would use TR185 um, to, um, to yeah, TR185 for rheology data, data uh, that, would, that would feed into that, so. Yeah, hopefully that answers that question. Okay, another question here on poly. Um, what form does uh, poly have um, and can it be recovered? Uh, poly either comes as a, a wet product um, in IBCs or it can come as a dry powder in a big bag. But either way, they, they, they're diluted to typically 0.1 to 0.3 um, milligrams per litre before they're dosed into the sludge. And uh, the answer is no, we don't, we don't recover this poly. This, this also goes to waste with the sludge. 
Um, okay. Um, yeah, so uh, another question here. Um, how do you maintain venting systems on tanks and route of any hazardous gases, hydrogen, methane, H2O, et cetera, and smells from the tank? Good question. So uh, obviously with uh, sludge digesters, um, that is obviously what we're trying to do there is actually uh, liberate gas. So we're actually storing gas essentially in the top part of that tank. Um, what we often have is obviously pipe work that comes from that to a gas holder. Um, but we also have um, something called Westo valves, uh, which are basically pressure relief valves, so that if the sludge, if the pressure builds up in that tank to an unacceptable level, it will essentially vent to atmosphere. Clearly, we want to avoid doing that, um, and we uh, would also get fined quite heavily by the, from the Environment Agency if we do. Um, so, what we often trying to do, trying to do there, is um, obviously trying to make sure that that, that pressure does not go above a above an acceptable level. So yeah, that's that's normally what we do with sludge digestion. Obviously with sludge sludge tanks, obviously as you say, there are, you know, they can be quite odorous. Um, the, the, what we often do with them is we have um, odor control systems that are basically just uh, basically sucking the, the, the nasty air from, from them tanks. So yeah, hopefully that answers that. <clears throat> okay, another question here. Uh, what do you do with digested sludge? Do you use it? Uh, used uh, dry buildings to turn it into pellets. Um, that's something that we used to do in the industry, but um, due to issues with dryers catching fire um, and also the cost to run them uh, with, with the, the natural gas, um, we've uh, actually mothballed a lot of our units. Um, so alternatives to dr drying the, the sludge, you can um, if you can get it to uh, above 50% dry solids, then it becomes combustible and you can generate energy from that um, alternatively it leaves the site as cake uh, and then it which is approximately 25 percent dry solids um, then that would go to either landfill or you have um, sludge beds that have a tension time of about six months until some of the biological content is reduced and it can be used for um, for spreading on fields for growing um, crops for livestock feed yeah, it's funny, um, actually using sludge dryers and getting sludge to pellet form, so down to you know 50% dry solids is actually quite beneficial um, because um, the shelf life of, of the, the product um, is actually longer compared to the cake. So we, at the moment what we, what we end up doing is we're using centrifuges to get cake to sort of 25% to 30% dry solids content, but it also has a shelf life. Um, which, which makes it more difficult to, to store, basically. Um, but, but the trouble with dryers, it's always a, a sort of balancing act between how much it costs to dewater sludge down to a certain, you know, down to sort of 50% compared to the cost of disposal. So it's always um, trying to get that balance right. Um, so let's have a look, and look at some other questions here. Um, can I offer more advice on measuring viscosity slash rheology? Um, yes, yeah, so uh, without talking about specific companies, but I will, I will mention someone, uh, a company called BHR, uh, British Hydrology Research Group, I think. Um, originally, we were set up by the water companies actually many years ago uh, to research certain, certain elements. Um, they, can, they actually offer that service. So there are companies out there that do actually offer that service um, that can do sort of lab testing of, of um, sludges. Um, we don't often use that, I'll be honest with you, um, because as I mentioned earlier about using um, progressing cavity pumps, we, we, we often use them because uh, they give us that margin for error in terms of trying to achieve that fixed flow that we want to. Um, and obviously going to the nth degree, finding the exact rheology of that particular sludge isn't always necessary. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answers that question. There's one there, James. Three questions, yeah. Um, <clears throat> So I'll, I'll answer one here. So, so mentioned here, uh, what compounds are found in the sludge which, make, which makes it aggressive? Are they salt acids or salts, perhaps? Um, good question. So, uh, one of the main issues with the with sludge um, is septicity. So, if you're not sort of looking after your sludge uh, properly, um, it does it can turn septic, and when it does that. Obviously, we have issues, so the, 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 the gases that it produces aren't particularly nice. Um, so in certain terms of the, the biogas that we end up liberating from um, uh, from uh, digested sludge, we end up with things like hydrogen sulfide, which obviously are very aggressive um, 
uh, you know, substance, um, and we have to be very careful about the the, the materials we use um, that come into contact with that. Um, so yeah, that, that's the, the main advice I'd, I'd give there. Okay, we've got uh, time for a few more questions. Okay. Yep, yeah, uh, another question here. Um, the outlet hopper for a gravity belt thickener usually have a sensor for triggering the outlet PC pump uh, to pump. Uh, we've had issues with these sensors. Uh, uh, Lines quite quickly um, if they're not maintained. Um, so yeah, we, we also have those issues, um, and we've recently been in discussions with um, several of our suppliers of uh, pumps, uh, thickeners, and, and dewatering equipment. Um, one of the new ideas coming through is that you can use a pressure transducer rather than um, a probe, um, and, and this enables you to to control control the speed of the pump as well. Um, um, and, and then if you want a high-level backup, you, you can still use a probe, but it's likely not to come into contact with the sludge until there's a problem with the pressure transducer. Yeah, of course, uh, a pressure transducer will also need maintenance, um, so you should allow for um, isolation uh, for cleaning and maintenance, but um, it, as long as you've got the backup um, to shut the system down or, or to raise an alarm, um, then it should be fairly, fairly safe. Alternatively, you can use um, other other instruments such as um, laser, radar, or um, ultrasonic, but there have been issues in the past with um, some of those sensors um, bouncing off of the, the surfaces um, in, in the tapered hopper. So um, we're thinking that a press transducer would be the most reliable. Okay, uh, I mentioned a question here. It says, stupid question, no such thing as a stupid question, uh, but what is the difference between thickening and dewatering? Is it just where it occurs in the process? That's a good question, I think. Um, so obviously the difference between thickening and dewatering is dewatering we're, we're getting sludge to, down to a solid form. So we're literally getting down to cake form, so we use centrifuges to do that. Thickening is obviously still in its liquid form. Um, so although it's in liquid form, it's just got less water in it. So we, and, and I, sp I suppose that the, you have sort of answered your own question there. Yes, it is where it happens in the process, basically. So we obviously thicken sludge so we have less to treat. So we have less substance to treat or um, but we also dewater sludge after we treated it to get it down to its um, solid form. So hopefully that gives you an answer there. Obviously, a lot of questions coming in now, but um, try and we'll try and get as, to as many as we can before sort of times up. Um, have you got any more, there, James? Yeah, so um, a question here on um, commissioning. What's the purpose of um, commissioning of these, these equipment types? So the main aim is to maximise the thickening and dewatering process um, in the most efficient way. Um, so the aim is to, to minimise the amount of chemical usage or polymer usage because uh, that's quite high cost. Um, so typically during a commissioning process, um, the commissioning engineer will um, keep tweaking the, the, poly, the poly rate until the um, quality of the sludge drops off, um, and then and then obviously increase it slightly again to get the full performance. So you're only using as much as you need of the poly, and you're not wasting any. Good, okay, good question. Yeah, uh, sorry if we don't get to all the questions. I'm sort of just trying to trying to get to ones. Um, there's one here about. Um, I was wondering if you have been imp impacted by the new EU medium combustion plant directive with more stringent limits on CHP emissions for existing and new units? If so, how have you mitigated, mitigated this? Good question. So we have, uh, have we been impacted by it? Yes, we have, certainly, um, for new and existing. Um, so with uh, spark ignition engines, you can essentially tune them to basically get um, the, the, uh, you know, the, the least nasty stuff in the um, exhaust, uh, in the emissions, basically. Um, so what we've ended up doing is we've had to start to look at that. So um, it's all, all to do essentially with our permits to put this, the emissions into the, into the atmosphere. Um, and we have these, these um, permits essentially with the, with the Environment Agency. Um, and obviously we're all sort of on an ongoing discussion. So these permits obviously are given to us at certain stages and then, and then they're renewed. Um, and we have to keep going back to them and, and having to look at the emissions we are putting into the atmosphere. So yes is the answer. Um, and it's, it's difficult to mitigate it, but, but we, are, we, we try our best um, and basically just keeping close contact with, with the EA about that. So. Uh, 
Uh, so the next one, is the post-THB hydrolyzed sludge more aggressive than non-hydrolyzed? Hydrolyzed, I'll get that in a minute. Um, so no is the answer. So, so the actual sludge itself um, is basically actually, um, essentially, uh, is, is super treated, so it actually be becomes more compliant. Um, so, but the, the aggressive stuff is actually the liquors that we get from, from THP. So the, the actual liquors that, that we um, get from it are quite aggressive, and you have to be very careful about when you reintroduce into the process. So obviously, all of our dewatering uh, and sludge treatment processes end up with, when we dewater, we obviously have sludge liquors, or the, the, the water content that we've taken out of the sludge. That is reintroduced, reintroduced to the process, uh, and when we do so, Obviously, you have to be very careful about about doing that. THP is 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 one of those important um, one of the most important things to consider with THP is what you do with the liquors that you you end up with. So, um, I think we're coming up to time now. I, I'm sorry if we haven't answered all your questions. Um, tried our best. Um, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Um, and yeah, like I say, look out for any future presentations that we end up end up trying to deliver. Uh, and any feedback would be would be much appreciated. Yep. Thanks everyone for listening. Yep. Um, yep. Look forward to doing another presentation in the future. Talk more about sludge. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Cheers.